Welcome to this video on Unity Scene Optimization. Our target is going to be Altspace, so some of the stuff that we're talking about is going to pertain to Altspace, but a lot of what we're going to be looking at in this video is going to be useful for any Unity Scene or any Unity project whatsoever. Uh, it could be a mobile app or it could be a, a VR, uh, VR game, but the concepts of optimization in Unity are pretty much the same across the board doesn't matter what the the target platform is doesn't matter what the um, what the version is for the most part uh, there's some difference from one version to the next uh, in unity on how the you know the various pieces parts of this work but for the most part it's um, it these are universal concepts Now what we're going to cover in this video we're going to talk about the diagnostic page that alt VR gives us uh, it's a useful art VR uh, specific um, tool and then the unity editor log is another useful tool that uh, will come in handy when you're trying to figure out how best to optimize your world uh, where your worlds are getting too big that sort of stuff we're going to talk a lot about the concept of texture compression and how to um, properly size your textures for your worlds and then a large portion is going to be spent on trying to demystify the settings for the baked lighting in your scene. What do all those different buttons and dials and um, all those settings mean? Which ones are the most important to us? Weird errors that you get and little artifacts. We're going to try and make a sense of all of that stuff. And then we're going to end up with uh, some thoughts on the best way to optimize your modeling or what kind of models should be using for a nicely well optimized scene. Getting right into the diagnostics page, it is your world building scorecard for Altspace. Um, you go to the the page for the um, the world on altvr.com and you click on the diagnostics button and it gives you this little screenshot that shows you how many objects are in your world, how big your world is, whether or not you're um, missing any kits. And this is useful if um, you've got something fundamentally broken with your world, especially if you're borrowing kits from somebody else and that person that you're borrowing the kits from may, may change the kit or delete the kit or delete their account or whatever. Um, those things can be spotted and rectified here on this diagnostic page as well. The Unity Editor Log, you get to it in Unity, and the first thing you need to do is build the scene. Uh, now, we're not going to upload this first build. We're just going to build the scene and then um, look at the Unity Editor Log, and there's going to be a lot of stuff in it. After I build the scene and I go over to Unity, what I'm looking for is this little hamburger button down here on the console and I click on that and I go to open editor log and it'll bring up notepad with this text document full of stuff and it records everything that happens in the editor as the editor session is going and what we're going to be looking for is down near the bottom you'll see um, and you can search for this look for bundle name uh, it'll be right after this long string of underscores so I'm looking for the bundle name then it's gonna be whatever the name of the file is that I gave it whether it's template or, or kit number or whatever 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 and then right at the top of this is a breakdown of everything that's in that in that build it's everything that's in the uh, the template or the kit that you're trying to upload and I can look and I see, look, wow, it's 24 and a half megabytes and 27 and a half megabytes of that is textures. Textures are 93% of this sample build that I did. And that's not uncommon for textures to be the biggest part of your build. It, they're it, they're going to be massive, especially if we're talking about baked lighting, because the baked light data is textured data, and it's included in this list right here. So if you're not careful with your lighting settings, if you're not careful with the, the lighting that you're generating, then this can get really bloated and really big and just just make your world tremendously big. The other stuff in here uh, is so small by comparison that it's hardly worth trying to, you know, reduce the size by by a handful of kilobytes. The other significant thing that you're likely to see is that your meshes could be really big. 
uh, depending on where you're getting your objects from and the number of faces that those objects have in them. <laughs> on the subject of texture compression, um, Unity makes this really easy. It used to be really hard if you were doing any kind of 3D development because you had to make sure that not only were your textures a, a, a nice size, but they had to be a power of two in either axis. So 512, 1024, 2048, something like that. Um, and all of your 3D engines needed them to be in powers of two or they weren't going to work very well. Unity will now take pretty much any resolution image that you want to throw at it and Unity will make it the closest power of two that it has to automatically and do all the mit mapping and do all that stuff for you. There's a bunch of stuff that goes on behind the scenes when you drop a texture into a Unity project that you don't you don't see. Well you, well, you can see it but you don't have to. Right? Unity does a lot of stuff for you. Um, so in this example here I've got three images. It's actually the same image just at different resolutions and it started off as a 4032 by 3024 image. A 6.4 megabyte image. Now this is the kind of image that comes off of your camera roll. Most phones take images um, at least this big or bigger considerably bigger some phones so you don't want to just take that image right off of your phone and drop it right into your unity project um, you're gonna want to you're gonna want to fix it up a little bit first and I've got the same image here except now I've reduced it in something like Photoshop now it's a 512 by 384 image and one thing you can notice is that you can't really tell these two apart, especially after I've got them into this PowerPoint presentation and I'm recording a video and putting it online and you're watching it on YouTube. These are essentially going to be the same image. And the same process is going to happen when I take an image and I drop it into Unity and I, I com compile it into a, a, a world and put it online. It's going to take this image and it's going to compress it down into something much more reasonable. Um, so that you really won't be able to tell, you know, between the two, between something like a 512 image. Now, I've also compressed it down to a 256 by 192 image. And I can look at the size difference. This thing is 55 kilobytes. It is over a thousand times smaller than it started. Now here I am starting to notice some... I get some jaggedy artifacts around the, around the edges of the shapes. The faces are all... Um, recognizable and pixelated and I can't read the textures on the shirts anymore can't read the text on there text and faces are going to suffer from over compression if I um, compress that image too much so I want to be selective because there is there is a point of not only diminished returns but there's a point of negative returns if I over compress an image because it's going to impact the quality of that image um, and make it look blocky and pixelated and stuff like this now, one thing that's so important to emphasize that I'm going to say it twice on two consecutive slides is that Photoshop is going to do a better job of this process than Unity is. Unity has the ability for me to drop an image in there and I can tell it, you know, I don't want this image to be any bigger than 256 on a side or 512 on a side. And Unity will, will dutifully and cheerfully go through the process of compressing that image down for us rescaling it down to the appropriate resolution. However, Photoshop is going to do a better job of it. Or something like Photoshop is going to do a better job of it. Speaking of setting the texture compression in Unity, every texture in your asset folder has this sort of interface on the um, on the inspector. And we can take a look at that. I've got a Unity project open over here with a bunch of textures. And if I select one of them, I see down here where I've got the overrides for PC and for Android. And it would have uh, Mac in here, or the default is um, Mac and PC. So PC, Mac, and Linux, I don't have any overrides set on this. Now, if I wanted to, I can come over here and I can set an override and give it a maximum size, say, of 512. And when it builds this texture, it's going to rescale this image down from whatever the original size was down to a, um, a 512 by 512 texture. And I can look at this. I can see the original size was 2048 by 2048, 2.7 megabytes. 
and if I compress it down, well, I won't see what the size is until after I build it. So, so that was me being too clever there. So I can select all of my textures if I want to, or select individual textures, and I can give them a maximum size. And then it won't really matter what the size was when it goes into the project, when Unity builds it, it's going to scale it back down to whatever size I specify in this as this override. And I can have different sizes for my PC and my Android side. So maybe my Android side, I, I want my textures to be a little bit smaller, or my... Um, PC side, I'm going to allow them to be bigger or maybe just leave them whatever the size is. And I can do that through this. On an individual texture by texture basis, I can uh, um, set, the, uh, set the maximum size. One thing to note, the default format for this compression is called RGB compressed ETC4 bits. And if I use that, then I will um, lose all of my uh, transparent texture information. If I'm using PNGs that have um, an alpha channel on them to do like glass effects or, or particle effects or something like that, this will um, turn all of those black. But I've got a ton of them to choose from. So, but just about any of them that have um, an RBGA next to them. RBGA the A stands for alpha. The alpha is the thing that, that uh, makes different parts of the texture transparent. So as long as your compression screen supports um, alpha information, you should be all right. Um, or you can just not compress your, your glass effects or your particle effects or something like that. However, there's no need for you to mess with any of this. Because, as I said before, Photoshop is going to do this job better than Unity is. Um, you're better off just avoiding avoiding this mess altogether and just making sure that the textures that I import are are already um, a nice size. Um, five twelve by five twelve is a is a really good size for for a texture. It's going to be able to convince. Um, be able to provide uh, convincing material information. It's going to look fine. It's, it's probably not going to be really big or blocky unless you spread it out over something really big. And so you're better off just providing textures that are the right size uh, to begin with and not having to to worry about this with Unity. However, if that's not an option, then Unity will uh, will take care of it for you. Talking about the baked lighting now. And baked lighting is um, its a big part of what we're going to be covering in this video. It's a big part of uh, um, achieving a high quality presentation for your, um, for your VR space. It also has the biggest impact on the textures that go into the build. And as we saw before, the textures have the biggest impact on the build size. So what you do with your baked lighting could be the single biggest impact on the size of your world um, outside of any wackadoodle geometry you might have. Baked lighting also gives you some nice effects like ambient occlusion, the, the, the shading in the corners, the, the realistic lay that the, the light plays off other light. And so if I've got like uh, multicolored walls and I want the light off of one wall to, to cast onto the adjacent wall, um, baked lighting does those sorts of things as well as reflections and light probes, emissive materials and glows. Baked lighting is the source of a lot of really cool, impressive, and immersive, right? The, the, these effects add to the immersion of the scene. If, they, if it looks more realistic, it looks, if it looks deeper, if it, if, it, if it looks richer like that, then when you get into that VR environment, it's going to be a better experience for you. And that's really the ultimate goal of all of this stuff. So my baked light map is a set of textures that represents color and shadow. And the size of the texture depends on the size of the geometry for the most part, as well as some of the other settings. Also, the number of objects can have a big impact in, um, in your scene. 
especially once you consider that uh, I can really only have one light map texture per object. I can have multiple objects taking up a, a light map texture, but I can only have one light map texture per object. Um, and as we can see in this example here, this is a um, it's a piece of light map data, so it's not just the shading, it's also the color of the light. So this object here has got some nice daylight coming through it. It's got some, some blue glow in the middle, and it's got some shaded pillars and looks like some windows. And it's also got a floor under it and then around the sides. And I can see the wireframe of the geometry, and I can see how the light map data is mapped to the wireframe of that geometry. So light map data is referred to as texels and textured data is stored as pixels. So I can have an image that is so many pixels. When we were talking about resolution of textures a few minutes ago, those were pixels, 512 by 192 pixels. Texels are something a little bit different. They still represent a single point of color information in a texture, but they don't have a relationship um, of any real um, logical association with the textures on the materials on, on the objects over which the the light map data is being laid so when unity is rendering a scene it takes the pixel data for the material and the associated texel data from the light map and that's what determines the the final color whether it's shaded or lit or glow or whatever and so the size of my object and we can see in this picture here this little checkerboard um, this represents the texels in the light map and how it's mapped to these objects in the scene. If I have the number of units and then one of the light map settings is texels per unit that tells me the size of the light map that it's going to take. So if I've got something that's say a uh, hundred units long and I have my texels set to 20 units per 20 texels per unit then that is going to need a light map that is at least 2,000 pixels on a side in order to accurately and completely contain that object. Um, and as we're about to see in a minute, it's a lot more complicated than that. Let's take a look at some light map data that I've got here in this sample scene. So this is a, um, it's an environment that I'm putting together uh, for an online game where the players sort of walk around inside this space. Now I've just got the hull of the space. It doesn't have any decorations or any detail objects in here. And the lighting that I've done with it is very simple. Um, I've just got just a handful of colored lights scattered around. to um, give me some some basic lighting in here. Now in this scene, this is all one object and it's it's a really, really big object. It's fairly large in terms of the number of units that it covers. But in a, if I look at my light map setting, I can see that I've got my maximum light map set to 512 with a light map resolution of 40 texels per unit. Right now I can tell you that that's way off. Because if I look at this object in the inspector, and I've got this thing here, here's this image of the actual light map that's, that's using to generate the lighting in here. This is only a 512 by 512 image. So and it's got the entire object scattered across it and I can see that it's got all these different colored areas so this is nowhere near the size of the light map data that this object would need in order to um, to um, accurately 
draw the lighting the way we have it set up. And I get this object over, I get this message over here. It says my object size in the light map has reached the max atlas size. Um, so even though I've got it scaled to a light map value of one, Unity is having to scale it down so that this one object can fit in this one 512 by 512 texture. So that's an example where Unity has scaled that light map or scaled the object down to fit within the uh, light map data that um, that we've got allocated for it. Because I've only got it set to one object, Unity can only use one light map to map that entire object. So it's going to have to scale it down to make it fit into the one 512 by 512 object that, I, um, that I've got specified for it. So my texels per unit, my max resolution on my light map determine the size of the large, largest object that can fit within that light map texture. Unity can only make these objects smaller to make them fit within the allocated light map size. Uh, it's not; it, it actually can make them bigger, um, but it when it does it automatically to make it fit, it'll only scale them down. But what this means is that if I've got a really small object and I want to give it some detailed lighting, I can increase the scale of this object by changing in the light mapping section. If I look at the actual asset, if I look at the actual geometry asset, I can change the scale of the light map. Now, I can't increase this one because it's already way too big to fit in this. But if I had smaller objects, I could give them an increased scale in my light map. I'll show you a different example of this by opening up this other scene over here. So this scene looks an awful lot like the other scene, except in this scene, each of my objects, or I've broken it up into different objects, 36 different objects, actually. And if I look at the, uh, say, uh, the light map data on one of these now I see that it now it fully fills my my light map size and I get a, a greater gradient I get more detailed shadings across um, across this uh, light map texture the other effect that it has is going to be on the size of my light maps if I open up go back to the first one and look at it I can see that because it's only using a single light map of 512 by 512 it's 700 K it's less than a megabyte of light map data that goes into this um, but I pay for that in other ways I pay for that with artifacts in the corners that green light that shouldn't be there that yellow light that green light that red light, they shouldn't be there. There's a stray patch of light that also shouldn't be there. There's another patch of light that shouldn't be there. We're going to be talking about these a lot, but just wanted to show those to you right now. But if I go back to the other scene where I've got it broken up into different objects, I see that now my light map has and I'm, I'm using a 256 by 256 light map size for this scene. It's broken up into 32 objects, 32 light maps, uh, for a total of 5.3 megabytes. So considerably more data being taken up, but it's, um, it's quality data. I get a better light map. I don't have any of those weird artifacts. I get better shading in the corners. I'm going to get an overall better result by using a little bit more data 5.3 megabytes for something this big really isn't that um really isn't that impressive in terms of the size so there's a balancing act in um in my lighting I can adjust the scale of my objects up. I can adjust the size of my light maps down. Um, 
I can increase the number of objects. I can decrease the number of objects. There's a there's a lot of variables that I can use to um, control the size of my light map data and the quality of my light map data. And for the most part, as my quality goes up, my size goes up, depending on where that size is coming from. This, it it could be wasted space in my light map textures. It could be um, the number of light maps that I'm using um, could be a number of different things but as my quality goes up my size is going to go up at an exponential rate and I'm going to reach a point where the increase in size no longer is worth the the benefit that I get in the quality coming out of this that's what they call a point of diminished returns where the returns that I get for the extra just um, extra effort just aren't worth the effort that I'm putting into it so I might as well just stop pushing it because this is where I'm going to get the best quality for my size now if I set my quality too low in this region down here I start running into a bunch of different artifacts And light map artifacts are a common problem when people are baking their light maps and they're, they're, they're trying to get their settings just right. Um, there are bright spots or shadows where the light shouldn't be. And it's because part of the light map is bleeding over from an, an adjacent object or an adjacent area that's, that's, probably, that's part of the same light map. Um, and it could be that the padding setting is too low or that the scale in my light map is too low and I'm probably going to be notified that I'm getting a bunch of overlapping UVs. Now, I love a problem that I can consistently recreate. And I'm going to do that here. So this is my, uh, this is my scene where I have a bunch of different objects. And I can look at the models. I can look at the... Here is the actual model file for this set. And if I look in the inspector, and I go down under the light map UVs setting, I can tell it what I want the minimum light map resolution to be for this individual object. And if I set that, and I also set the same thing on my light map resolution. Now, I haven't given it. I haven't given it bigger light map size. I haven't given it, say, a 512 or a 1024 light map. I'm just telling it that I want these objects to have 40 texels per unit in the light map data, but I also want my light map size to be a minimum of, or a maximum of 256 on a side. The math isn't going to work out for that. If I look at the light map resolution, if I look at the size of the objects, then it's going to require that the image size the light map size be bigger than 256 otherwise it's going to have to start scaling everything down and that's fine we'll make it scale everything down I'll generate the light maps okay so now we're done and now I see that it has taken 56 directional light maps to do this with the uh, light map resolution set to 40 which is frankly way too high if I look at any of these objects I also got this error message over here there are 35 objects in the scene with overlapping UVs please see the details list below or use the UV overlap visualization method uh, blah 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 now UVs are a term from a modeling package, they're a modeling term, right? And it's it's what you use to assign textures uh, to different parts of a material surface. So you look at a you look at an error like this, and especially if I look over here and I say the game object has overlapping UVs. Please adjust mesh importer settings or increase chart padding in your modeling package. This is going to make you think that you have to go all the way back to 3D Studio Max or Blender in order to in order to figure out how to solve this problem and it it's not <laughs> it's not 
So if I open up the preview for this, I see here's the light map, and it's like, well, I don't see any overlapping UVs. What that means is that the space, I scroll on here, and these little squares, once again, they represent texels. And I've got what Unity calls a chart, right? So a chart is going to be a section of geometry like this. Like, see how this this represents sort of the polygons in a single wall. And this looks like maybe another piece of wall or a piece of floor or something like that. But each of these is what Unity refers to as a chart. And if I look in my light map settings, I have a light map padding of two texels. What has happened is because of the size and how Unity is having to cram this object into one object or into one uh, uh, light map texture, now the space between these charts is less than the padding that I've got set. It wants to try and keep two texels in between each one of these charts, but it may not be able to because of how it has to cram them in here. So here's another place. This area right here is what Unity is going to report as being overlapped UVs because the two different charts are within the padding distance apart from each other. That is also what causes these artifacts. Because if I go back to this, go back to my other scene, So here's the scene. I know it looks almost exactly the same. This is the scene that only has one object in it. And if I open it up, we'll zoom down in here. There's going to be all sorts of padding issues associated with this. And I can see down in here where I'm seeing some of those because they're so close together. Here's an example where I've got this red chart down here, and there's red light spilling over into this adjacent chart. That is probably not what I wanted to do. So for an object like this, I may look at the lighting and go, what? 700k of lighting data that's great this world is going to be small but your lighting is going to be very crude it, it especially if i start populating this with with smaller objects it's not going to look very good and it's eat up with these artifacts every room has got something wrong with it So going back over to the multi-object mode, that's what this error message is saying: is that my objects, the way they're being, the way Unity is spacing them, and Unity admittedly does not do a perfect job of scattering these objects across different textures like this. It it, it does okay. It, I I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to try and do it. I'm really glad that Unity does it, but it doesn't do the best job. So your job as a world designer is to make it easier for unity to do what it needs to do so if i've got weird artifacts like this around here the it's because the padding is too low and that could be because the scale in my light map is too low um, i'm also going to be getting warnings of uh, overlapping uvs so i can decrease the minimum a light map size for that object. Uh, this all can be done on an object by object basis. Or I can increase the size of the um, the light maps, the individual light maps that I'm using. It all depends on the makeup of your scene, right? There's there's not any there's not going to be a magic formula. There's not a magic number that's going to work for every scene, every setting, every piece of geometry. And it's going to be an iterative process. You'll try some changes. You'll you'll build the light map data. See what see what it does. See how it works for you. Make some changes and try again. Because there's not going to be a perfect solution. These aren't tools. These are instruments. Uh, you have to you have to learn how to play them. And um, once you get a hang of it, 
you'll be using tools like the uh, the diagnostics panels and the editor log um, a lot less because you'll just be able to tell by the way the, the, the game engine is responding and the results that you're getting. There's a couple extra draw modes that uh, could help you out while you're optimizing your scenes. Um, overdraw, which is uh, this sort of sepia-toned x-ray kind of view up here, tells you how much work the renderer is having to work um, just to sort the textures or sort the polygons. So brighter brighter spots like this is a set of steps over here in the corner this is a, a fountain uh, both of those have a lot of stacked faces on top of each other to achieve like a multi-leveled effect and that is causing the um, the renderer to have to work harder to draw those areas so this is a, a tool that can can tell you where the the heavy spots are um, on your world or where your geometry is, is not very um, efficiently built the uh, the baked lighting will give you this view that will show you how the texels are going to be displayed across the uh, the surface so you can see which regions um, are getting too much light map data or maybe not enough light map data. Um, and then another one that will be really helpful, especially if you're chasing down artifacts or your, um, your overlapping UVs, like in this scene right here, before I rebuild the data, if I go down to UV overlap, it shows me a similar view where I see the texels, but these red areas are regions where the charts are too close for the padding. So in all of these red regions, I have areas where I might run into artifacts. So you want your geometry to fit within the light map. If your geometry is too big, you may want to break it up into multiple objects unless you know, you, you want to take advantage of having one really big object that doesn't have a whole lot of light map scale to it. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to waste a lot of space in your light maps. And it may take a good bit of an experimentation to find the, the right combination of um, texel resolution versus uh, light map scale versus um, maximum light map size. Uh, those things all play together, right? And they, they rely on things like the size of your geometry and the number of objects that you have. Um, so all those different variables sort of play together. Large, broad objects really don't need a lot of light map data. If I'm, say I've got a, um, I don't know, like a football stadium where I've got stands and a field and, and bleachers and stuff. Um, I want to save the detailed light map size for smaller objects that you may come up close to. So if if the if the player never gets close to an object, it doesn't need a large light a, a, a big scale in a light map. If it's a big thing like the field at the bottom of the stadium, it doesn't need a lot of light map data because it's pretty much just a big a big plain field. Um, only the things like the 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 seats and the handrails and things that people are actually going to be getting close to and that are smaller and more detailed then give those individual objects a, a bigger scale than the light map and you'll be saving a lot of size by not having huge light maps that are, are covering all of the geometry you could save the low resolution stuff for the stuff that's really big and we're far away and then make the higher resolution stuff for the, the the smaller detailed things that the players or the users players users whatever it's a video game are going to be getting closer to and you can change these settings on an object by object basis so you really want and this is where the design comes in you have to think about where are the users going to be going in my world what are they going to be looking at what as the designer what am i going to allow them to get close to and the things that are far away don't give them a lot of light map data. 
because uh, they're just going to be unnecessary expense in terms of the in terms of the build size. And then finally, we want to talk about the modeling for your objects. Um, and a lot of the optimization for your modeling is going to come right out of the modeling package. There's really not a whole lot that Unity can do to optimize your models. It all depends on if, if you build them yourself in something like Blender or 3D Studio or you find them from third-party assets like uh, the Unity Asset Store or Sketchfab or something like that. You want to pay attention to the polygon count and the size of the geometry in these. Um, the the sample that we looked at earlier with the editor log where the, the geometry was less than a megabyte and 93% of the build size went into textures, that's kind of what you want to be shooting for. You want the textures to be doing all of the work of describing the material surface, of defining details. Um, you don't need to model every screw on... Um, on a, on a plate surface. Um, you can have the screws be part of the texture and that, that screw information be part of the textures. Um, so do as little detail modeling as possible in your 3D models. Um, as much as you can, let the textures do the work of describing what a surface looks like as opposed to letting geometry do that. Delete all the unseen faces. So if I've got um, walls that are two-sided and my my world has an inside wall and an outside wall but I'm never gonna go outside I if I'm never gonna see that wall and I don't want my users to ever see that wall then I might as well delete that wall because that wall could be taking up a lot of space in my um, in my light map data same thing for um, geometry under the floor floor only needs to have one side uh, if I put a box in my world as the floor and my users are never going to see the underside of the floor, I might as well delete it in my modeling package um, because it's just going to add unnecessary size to the world. And then um, you want to make you want to be careful about what things you make large in large unique objects or small individual objects. Uh, in this scene, my um, the majority of the the hull walls what, I, what I'm describing is like the the outer shape of the of the scene is um, just a handful of large objects but then I've got bigger I've got smaller objects that I'm using for the detailed geometry this can this can increase performance because if unity has a bunch of identical objects it can do what they call batching them together, sort of treat it as if it's one object, and it increases performance. However, as we looked at earlier, if I have a bunch of small objects in my light, my light data, it actually could increase the size of my baked light map data to have um, a bunch of individual objects versus one large object. And it all, it all depends on that balancing act of quality over size. And we have reached the end of our video. So um, thank you for watching. I hope that you found this um, useful and helpful and um, provides a lot of information that you can use to um, improve not just the quality but the size of your worlds. Thanks again.